Hello and welcome. On behalf of CME Outfitters, thanks for joining us today for the CME snack titled HIV and Pregnancy, What is the Guidance? This program has been supported by an independent educational grant from Gilead Sciences. So the goal of this educational activity is to empower learners to integrate guidelines recommended surrounding the HIV management in pregnancy and perinatal care. I am Dr. Martina Bedell. I'm an associate professor in the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine in the Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. I'll be their moderator for today's snack activity, and I'm happy to be joined by my esteemed colleague from the Department of Health and Human Services panel on treatment of HIV during pregnancy and prevention of perinatal transmission, Dr. Florence Montplaisir. Great, and I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Bedell, for this um, uh, and the program uh, organizers for this invitation. I am uh, Florence Montplaisir. I am an assistant professor um, in the Division of Infectious Diseases and associate chief for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and a fellow of the Leonard Davis Institute at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in Philadelphia. Um, we're also really thrilled and happy to have Janelli um, Alejandra with us today, who will start off with a story of her experience living with HIV and becoming a mother of three. Hi, my name is Janelli Alejandra. Thank you so much for having me. I feel so grateful to be here. Um, I am a mother of three children. I've been living with HIV since 2010, and I've had my children in 20. 12, 2013, and 2015. Um, all of my children are HIV negative. Um, they are running around. I have had to lovingly kick them out of the house to go to grandma's for a little bit so they could be quiet. Um, again, thank you so much for having me. I've been um, an HIV advocate now for several years. And the core of the reason, uh, my why, behind why I wanted to come out with my HIV status was really truly to help women who were HIV positive because unfortunately so many women find out about their HIV status when they are pregnant um, because that's oftentimes their first HIV test. Um, and so um, I wanted to share my experience of um, having a uh, basically simple, um, almost boring <laughs> pregnancy of uh, being undetectable um, and having my children. Um, I will say that uh, it was very scary at first. When I first found out I was pregnant, I found out about a year and a half after I was HIV positive that I was pregnant um, uh, unexpectedly. And so I uh, first assumed that I would need an abortion. Um, and then I um, was blessed to be around people who educated me, including my infectious disease doctor and um, several nurses. And they um, let me know that the risk was quite low. Um, but unfortunately, um, I had found an OBGYN that I really liked um and i thought you know that that was going to be my OBGYN for as long as i could um and they were my OBGYN before i was pregnant but once i found out once they found out excuse me that i was pregnant um they said you know hang tight in the waiting room i was you know holding the you know sonogram super excited ready to see what was next and then uh was called to the doorway in the waiting room and was told, I was handed a sticky note with um, the local university hospital's number, um, just like a generic number you can get off the website. And she said, I haven't had an HIV case since uh, like the 80s, so I don't know what to do with you. So you're gonna have to go here. Um, this was in a waiting room uh, and this is quite unfortunate. And unfortunately this was not, um, not unheard of when I talked to other women who are living with HIV, um, who are, have also found out while they were, um, you know, pregnant and or even before, um, they don't have always the most positive experience with either a doctor and or even the healthcare staff. And so um, it's something that I really um, ask the medical community to educate their entire team on from the front desk all the way through to the building, everyone in between, um, that they know the factors, especially in an OBGYN setting, um, even the practice administrator, whomever is going to be interacting with a patient who's living with HIV should know the risks because they will be the source of comfort and the source of education for that patient. Patient. Um, so once I was able to go over to the university hospital, um, you know, I was I found myself um, with a couple of residents there. It was quite funny. I felt like I went from being kicked out of an OBGYN to having residents 
you know, chomping at the bit to get me as their patient because they wanted to uh, interact with somebody who was HIV positive. Um, and so a lot of the stigma and misinformation that I had to deal with came from my own ignorance, um, just not knowing what the risks were. And I felt um, just so privileged to be at a, um, at a space where I would be able to be educated by residents who, like I said, were eager to, to inform me. Um, and so I went through my pregnancy, everything was textbook fine. I changed my medicines. I went from uh, one pill a day to then six pills a day. I was first, uh, this was back in 20, uh, 11, 2012, so I was taking Kalatra and Combivir, um, and I'm not sure which made me more nauseous, the pregnancy or the medicine, but it wasn't quite very pleasant. Um, so by the time I was, gave birth, uh, I think my last day for all three of my pregnancies, it was, you know, the last day when they finally induced me that, that I, my blood pressure shot up, and so I had to be put on magnesium, um, and was diagnosed with preeclampsia, but it wasn't a factor during the pregnancy. So it was quite, you know, typical. Um, the fear was always, will someone find out? Will someone reject me? Will someone try and take my kids away? Um, that was always the biggest fear, especially with my first one. So um, went through the process, had my baby while I was in labor for my first two boys. Um, it was uh, required or, you know, uh, basically mandated, not really sure what the medical term is, but the the procedure was for me to have um, an a, a IV drip of um, AZT medication while I was in labor. Um, and it made me put me at ease as well. Um, of course, although I was already undetectable, you know, when you're a mom, you do everything you can to protect your children. And so I made sure that everything was okay. Uh, gave birth vaginally, uh, was a pretty easy birth, uh, thankfully. Um, and then by the time I had my third child, um, I was told that the AZT drip, this was in 2015 when I had my last one, it wasn't uh, mandatory anymore. And so I uh, decided on my own that I wanted to go ahead and keep that drip just for my own peace of mind. I figured, you know, third time's a charm. Let's do everything that we've, did, that we've done it before. Let's just keep it simple. Um, and I did. Um, for my first two children and my boys, I had to um, administer the Zidovudine for six weeks. Um, after birth. Um, that was also a bit um, nerve-wracking. Um, I don't know what, of course, each practice's um, situation is different, but if there could be some sort of education between OB and pediatrician in any sense, um, I implore that communication to happen um, because I think that for me, the fear was also, will the pediatrician be accepting of this? Will they turn their backs towards us or what will happen? Um, Thankfully, I had positive um, interactions with my pediatricians. I think the only kind of negative interaction we had was um, my two oldest boys are 11 months apart. They're really close in age. So by the time my oldest was taking his last like 18 month um, test and my uh, second kiddo was taking one of his you know, mid-year uh, tests, we went to go get our labs done. And my husband and I, my husband joined us because you know juggling two babies in a lab is difficult. So we both went together. And um, the phlebotomist was very nice, super charming, su playing with the children. Um, she was lovely. Um, and then she read the labs and said, oh, are these kids foster kids? And we said, no, there there are children. And um, immediately it turned negative, uh, the experience. She went from being super playful and kind to my children to um, almost being rough with them and being rude to us as parents and um, did not speak to us for the remainder of the appointment. Um, and so, it could have gone worse. She could have been abusive towards us, but it still was not a pleasant experience. And for us, it was, it, it felt very, um, it very felt shameful. It, it was full of stigma. It made us feel like, are we doing something wrong? Um, did we, did we make a mistake having these children? Um, to which case we know now, of course not, but it, it is quite a shame inducing. Um, by the time my, my third kiddo came, we wanted to kind of do everything the same as before, but we were told uh, with our third child that the process now was to have only four weeks of Zidovudine. Um, and because uh, anemia, I think, was a factor in the other two. And my boys, thankfully, they were um, they were anemic for just a few months, really, at the end of their six-week trial or six weeks of Um, But they're super happy and healthy now. Uh, thank goodness, you know, everything has gone well with them. Um, but otherwise, um, I really... <sighs> where most people may have not like to be around other people um, who are 
learning or a, a teaching hospital, excuse me, I absolutely loved it. Um, I loved having, um, being able to teach so many people about the risks or lack thereof um, when giving birth while you're undetectable and HIV positive. Um, I know that uh, I think twice in my uh, labors, we had um, paramedics come in and, and watch. I think they were expecting some like really big process with like hazmat suits and all that, and it didn't happen. So it was a little bit anticlimactic for them, but uh, which is a good thing, you know. But uh, I kind of just said, sorry, this is sort of kind of boring. I've been indetectable since I was diagnosed, basically. So there really isn't too much of an issue here. But um, it opened the door for a lot of conversations and it opened the door for a lot of bonding. So um, I wish I knew that um sooner that there were people out there who were going to be just incredibly helpful to be able to hold our hand through this and i wish i also knew kind of um my rights as a parent in the sense of knowing what the process was for afterwards and making sure that i knew what was going to be what was going to what was going to be happening with um the follow-up appointments afterwards. I know I felt very scared to be, you know, just 15 minutes late to an appointment, you know, juggling. By the time we had three, we had three kids in diapers. It was tough. And I was afraid that, you know, would we get reported to CPS for not showing up on time? Would they assume that we were going to bail? Um, and if that was the case, I, I had the privilege of being insured, of having my own transportation, of having um, so many factors available to me that many other people who are living with HIV do not. Um, so um, although I know this isn't the forum for any kind of reform in that way, um, I do feel that it is um, the a practice and or a physician's um, duty to make sure that those uh, barriers, that we do what we can to eliminate those barriers for those patients and, um, and their, their children. Um, I don't know what sort of questions or what I might not have answered. I, I, I can ramble on for forever, but um, yeah, I'm just, again, very grateful to be here. And if there is anything that comes up, um, I'm a little bit out of, out of date. I haven't had a kiddo in eight years, but uh, if there's something else I can chime in with or have any questions for me, I'll be here. Thank you so much for sharing your story um, with so much honesty and um, humanity to it. We really appreciate it. Experiences like yours and so many others are the reasons why, you know, we work to continue to update the HIV perinatal guidelines and do education on evidence-based care for patients that are having um, children or are interested in having children and really starting that planning in advance so that you know, our patients with HIV, even before they get pregnant, don't have to have the experience you had, which is being terrified and not sure if they can continue and not knowing what's safe. And so I think really integrating pre-pregnancy counseling throughout someone's life um, time living with HIV is really important and, and doing education and advocacy is so important. Um, some of the things just to discuss are sort of reproductive desires for all um, people living with HIV on an ongoing basis, you know, discussing effective and appropriate contraception method if pregnancy is not desired, and if it is desired, you know, how do we optimize um, health pre-pregnancy and to reduce the risk factors for transmission. You've mentioned it a number of times, being undetectable is really the number one thing um, during pregnancy and pre-pregnancy as far as reducing that risk. And so working with patients on strategies and how to become undetectable and maintain that in pregnancy. We also want to talk about potential effects of HIV and, and antiretroviral drugs on maternal and fetal health outcomes and kind of being really thoughtful to optimize how um, moms and their babies do in pregnancy. We recognize that we do need to use ARVs and so how do we continue um, the HIV medications just continue to get better and better, but pregnant um, people are excluded from almost all of the new drugs and new developments. And so um, how do we study that in order to ensure that, that people who are pregnant are not just put on old regimens that we know have worse side effects and less viral suppression, but balancing the unknown um, of new medicines in pregnancy, I think, so really striving to include uh, pregnant people in research studies and doing them as safely as possible is really important. Um, focusing on strategies to optimize health and then, you know, evidence to support shared decision making about infant feeding. Um, those guidelines are evolving and have evolved significantly from previously having a recommendation of absolutely no breastfeeding for people living with HIV to today saying, you know, for patients who are living with HIV and are undetectable and 
you know, understand the information that's available, you know, may choose to breastfeed and how do we support them? And as you mentioned already, um, you know, the fear of defects being called or um, families living with HIV being penalized and really the, the, the guidelines have come out to say that's not an appropriate um, response and instead sort of support using the data that we have and information that we have is really important. I don't know if you guys have other thoughts on pre-pregnancy before I move to the next slide. I, I, pre-pregnancy uh, consultation is, is wonderful. And I know for me, um, I had assumed no kids for me. Um, so, but I had always wanted them. So it was very difficult at first, um, but I'm very grateful that I had my infectious disease doctor begin to um, just have those conversations in a very kind of, of course, no pressure kind of way, but just say the option is there. Um, so that way, when I did become, you know, a parent pregnant, although my, of course, my, my first was just fear and concern, I knew there wasn't out and there was sort of a slight at the end of the tunnel. And so just knowing that that's an option, um, especially for um, people who are so newly diagnosed, it's so much, it's, it's a traumatic moment for them who are you know, living with HIV, not only just finding it out, but usually it's tied to obviously sex, which is a very vulnerable uh, space, which can lead to a lot of trauma. And so being able to have those conversations beforehand to kind of give some, some sense of hope um, is really important. Um, so big advocate for, for that. Yes, and what I would also say is that um, uh, un unfortunately, Janelle, you got to experience the, the stigma associated with HIV that no one should um, experience. And, um, uh, you know, on behalf of the healthcare community, I really apologize for the, the mishaps that you encountered. Um, and we'll get to discuss this a little bit more, but I do want to take the time to acknowledge the, the coercive practices that have happened uh, historically um, when thinking of reproductive autonomy, uh, particularly for um, cisgender women, but also people of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so just wanted to sort of mention that. Yes, thank you for that. You know, one of the key things, and, and we've been discussing it, is um, having a fully suppressed viral load in pregnancy. Um, this is a French perinatal cohort where they looked at, you know, over 14,000 women with HIV um, in pregnancy um, who delivered from 2000 to 2017. And they found that um, for those women who were fully suppressed on antiretrovirals at conception and continue to be undetectable near delivery, that the incidence of perinatal transmission was zero. Um, for those that were not suppressed at conception or not at delivery, you know, we do know there's, there is a risk of transmission, which is what they found. But this study, along with some other studies, is where the recommendation shifted in regards to um, need for AZT around the time of delivery. Um, also, in regards to route of delivery as for C-section versus vaginal delivery. And I think um, studies like this and others, it's really promising to see that with an undetectable viral load that we can tell our patients that the risk of transmission can be um, essentially zero. Yes, and I, and I think that that's something that we should celebrate as, as, you know, healthcare workers, as, you know, people living with HIV, the fact that we've been able to make those incredible achievements and to be able to say that um, if uh, uh, an individual living with HIV remains undetectable throughout pregnancy and the postpartum period that their risk of transmission to their baby um, is less than 1%, which is, which is great news. Um, but I, I, I do want to sort of go back to the conversation, particularly with the experience that Janelle had around um, her fear of parenting and her fear of being pregnant um, because this is something that a lot of women with HIV have encountered and continue to encounter. Um, and um, it, it's also important to, to uh, understand that um, people with HIV who are achieving pregnancy uh, for decades have been um, fighting to have their sexual and reproductive rights uh, recognized. Um, uh, just because um, uh, historically people have not even uh, considered pregnancy as an option for them if they were living with HIV. 
Um, but also uh, there have been uh, coercive measures such as forced sterilization and coerced abortion uh, for uh, people uh, living with HIV. And uh, that's why I was really happy to see that in 2020, um, the UNAIDS uh, published a report uh, stating that regardless of uh, people's HIV status, um, that people have the right to start a family and have children. They have the right to decide how to space their pregnancy. Um, and um, they also have the right to have, um, to, to decide their reproductive uh, health choices. And, and our role as providers is to help them through the process, provide a safe space where they can have those discussions um, and guide them through an informed uh, decision-making uh, process, how to best choose, right, the, the right reproductive health choices for, for them. Um, as uh, Dr. Bedell mentioned, both of us uh, actually uh, are members of the perinatal guidelines, and we do support that statement. And I think we go a little bit further to say um, that if couples are unable to conceive, that HIV status should absolutely not be the reason why they shouldn't um, proceed with infertility treatment. Um, and, and it's very important to, um, uh, to have those discussion with patients very frequently um, and, and as providers assess uh, the, their intentions to become pregnant. Um, and if someone um, decides to pursue pregnancy, uh, it's important to optimize their health so that when they're entering pregnancy, they're in the best of shape. Um, but also if they decide that they don't want to achieve pregnancy to help them um, decide which contraceptive method is, is, is best for them. And in the process, um, asking about their partner's HIV status is important. And also disclosure is encouraged because we know from the data that when um, uh, pregnant individuals have supportive partners that they tend to do better with retention in HIV care and, and vowel suppression. Um, but of course, disclosure has to be done in a safe way. And if there is a fear for violence or any other concern, um, this should also be uh, respected. Um, and, and so disclosure is important, but it's not necessary to, to achieve, uh, to help people achieve pregnancy. Um, and I also want to say that um, it's important to recognize that transgender and gender diverse individuals have been particularly stigmatized. Um, and, um, but it's important to uh, understand uh, their needs and support them, particularly those who are female uh, sex uh, adver uh, uh, adverse, um, and, and to really support them through that process in a, in a non-stigmatizing -stigma way. Yes, thank you for that. And I think I agree that we work really hard on the guidelines to not to not just say, um, you know, you should provide care, but to go even above and beyond and say you, we have to be really careful that that people living with HIV are not excluded from any care or not coerced into um, different reproductive care and choices that, you know, everyone else has. So. I think it's really important. Um, same with contraception options and and studying all the various methods of contraception. And you know, most of the time they don't interact with HIV medications. They're safe to use, and so people living with HIV for the most part have full choice as far as their contraception um, options. And I think in the past it was potentially coerced into sterilization, and you know that should not be happening anywhere anymore. As far as some of the ARV use in pregnant people with HIV, um, Dr. Montplazier, would you like to talk a little bit as far as like medications, preferred alternatives, how we try to determine the, the best regimens or what to use in pregnancy? Absolutely. So the, the main thing to remember is that the treatment for, preg uh, for pregnant people doesn't really differ significantly among people who are uh, not pregnant. Um, so as baseline, we do provide a three drug regimen, so three active drugs uh, against the virus. Um, and um, the treatment recommendations that I'm gonna go over are pe for people who are treatment naive, meaning that they have not been on antiretroviral therapy in the past. Um, and the, the preferred regimen is to use um, 
to nucleoside in trans transcriptase uh, inhibitors um, and another class, uh, including either an integrase uh, inhibitor, which is valutegravir, or a protease inhibitor, which is boosted durinovir. Now, um, th those names might seem a little fancy, but it, essentially what they describe is how the antiretrovirals stop the HIV virus from replicating throughout the life cycle. Um, and so uh, one of the reasons why valutegravir is uh, the preferred regimen uh, in pregnancy is because it's very well tolerated. Uh, it often is combined um, um, and, and can uh, rapidly uh, decrease uh, the HIV viral load during pregnancy, which is very important when thinking about the risk of uh, transmission to, to the fetus. Um, there have been some concerns around the risk of neural tube defects, particularly when valutegravir is used very early around the preconception uh, period. But we have updated data showing that that risk is very low. Um, and in general, the benefit of offering a treatment that is well tolerated, that can suppress the HIV uh, virus really well throughout the pregnancy period is uh, pivotal and very important uh, during uh, HIV management. Um, now, the boosted durinavir uh, still is a preferred regimen um, because we have a long track record of safety of using uh, durinavir during pregnancy. Um, the caveat is that it, it does come with a higher pill burden. Um, but because of its safety and also because it has a high barrier to resistance, meaning that even if people miss a few pills, that the, the drug levels remain high and there is a, high, a very low risk of, of um, developing resistance. So for those reasons, um, both dalutegravir and boosted durinavir with, a, with two um, uh, nucleoside uh, inhibitors remain the, the, the preferred regimen. Um, alternatively, um, raltegravir, uh, which is also an integrase inhibitor, um, is, uh, is, uh, can be used uh, during pregnancy. The reason why it's not preferred is because it requires a twice a day dosing, and it doesn't have that, uh, the, the high barrier to resistance that dalutegravir has. Um, and uh, boosted adazanavir, which is also a protease inhibitor, falls under the alternative regimen. Um, it, it can have more side effects compared to uh, uh, durinavir, um, and, and so that's why it's really on the alternative regimen. Other drugs uh, fall in that category, such as efavirenz um, and wilpivirine and zidovidine, um, but the, the reason why they really fall under the alternative regimen is mostly because of their side effects. Um, and during pregnancy, we try to provide the minimal number of pills, the ones with the higher barrier to resistance, and the ones that are more tolerated. Uh, now, there are a couple of medications, particularly the newer agents that have come out, including Bictegravir, that is very popular and used uh, among non-pregnant people very often, where we currently have not, we don't have enough data, but we are gathering um, that, that information and hopefully in the next couple of months to years, we'll have enough information to um, think about initiating um, a big tag review in pregnancy. It's, it's very important to know that in general for the guidelines, um, if someone is taking an antiretroviral regimen before pregnancy and tolerating this regimen really well um, and is virally suppressed, it's okay to continue. So for example, uh, individuals who are entering pregnancy on Bictegravir can continue this regimen if they are doing well, uh, but it's not recommended to initiate Bictegravir uh, for a treatment naive uh, patient. Doravirine similarly falls under the insufficient data um, uh, category. And then there are a slew of meds that are not recommended. And the reason why they're not recommended is because we honestly just have no data on them, particularly safety data. 
uh, and that particularly applies for the long-acting injectables, which are cabotegravir and rolpivirin. We don't know, um, you know, in terms of the 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 PK data how how much drug levels uh, are achieved during pregnancy. We don't know about the short and long-term effects uh, to the fetus, and so for that reason, it's not recommended. Um, and um, for similar reasons, um, particularly be related to drug levels or side effects, uh, the following drugs are not recommended, and they include uh, elvitegravir, lupivirine, etravirine, nevirapine, and cobicistat. Um, so that's, that's in, in, you know, in general, that the major take-home point is that we need three active drugs, the enterbrace inhibitor, particularly dolutegravir, is the preferred regimen, and boosted dorinavir also remains preferred. Um, but in general, these are general guidelines. It's very important to think of the patient in front of you um, and, and thinking about their needs. Um, the alternative regimens can be used, even if they're not preferred, depending on the particular situation with the, with the patient. Great, yeah, I think, um as the obstetrician that kind of gets patients after they're already pregnant, um, we, we really encourage patients to stay on their medicine. We find that sometimes patients, and this isn't just HIV, the same goes for seizure medications or medications for lupus, et cetera, that patients um, sometimes will stop their medicine if they're not sure if they're safe. And then there's a lag period before they can get in and actually see a physician. And then, you know, there's the side effect with stopping. In this case, it's a bump in viral load. And then restarting medications, sometimes more prone to side effects. And as Janelle pointed out, early pregnancy is also a time where nausea vomiting happens to so many patients. And so it's not the ideal time to be changing medications, starting new medications. And so, you know, we really try to encourage um, that if they're on a medication, it's working well for them, they're suppressed. Even some of the ones that aren't recommended, um, like alvitegravir, if they've been on it and they're fully suppressed, we discuss just watching their levels more closely in pregnancy because with that, it's the fear of um, the, the levels maybe not being high enough, although clinically we found women or patients with HIV can still do well on that. And so just having a conversation um, with patients about what's working for them and continuing it if it's not a um, safety issue in regards to fetal risk or maternal risk and just trying to get patients in um, with a positive pregnancy test to have these conversations. But we realize that there are barriers to, to getting into care and, um, and being seen. And so trying the same thing, the preconception conversation is important, but we don't always get to do it. And therefore just early pregnancy care and early conversation about medications is really important. One of the next things that we wanted to go over is just HIV-related laboratory monitoring for pregnant people um, with HIV. Pregnancy is a time where um, we collect a fair amount of labs and, you know, are coming in for care essentially every month um, and then more frequently towards the end of pregnancy. One of the key things to monitor is the viral load. So we always want to get that at entry to care. We want to do it um, at least every trimester um, or every three months, once suppressed, and then um, around the time of delivery. The delivery viral load helps us ensure that we're selecting the correct route of delivery, vaginal versus cesarean. Um, and then that can sort of guide our counseling as far as risk of transmission and overall maternal health. The CD4 count similarly is done at entry, and then depending on the CD4 count, um, at least every three months if it's low or inconsistent adherence. And then in general, we want to do an HLA um, check if they're not virally suppressed. We do monitor for anemia, kidney and liver function um, more frequently in pregnancy and you know, may even do it more frequently than, than this chart, depending on the specific medication and how um, the patient is doing. And then you know, depending on the specific medication, additional drugs may be indicated, but we do sort of counsel that pregnancy is a time where you'll get your viral load monitored fairly frequently. Some clinics do it every month since patients are coming every month. And then just in case you miss a visit or transportation or so forth that um, as we see patients and we're frequently doing other labs that, that will monitor that really closely um, since it's so linked to our counseling. 
Um, there is a note here about um, obtaining consultation. So, you know, some um, patients are lucky to live in big cities where there's big academic institutions and there may be a local expert or multiple experts on HIV and pregnancy, but lots and lots of patients are gonna live in areas that, that maybe they don't have that. And it's really important that they know and that their providers know that there's a 24 seven perinatal HIV AIDS hotline um, that they can contact when you know questions come up. Sometimes there's really individualized or, or patient, patient specific questions. And then similarly, that the panel on HIV treatment during pregnancy and the prevention of perinatal transmission, um, we update our guidelines every year and they're accessible online um, and they are available to anyone. We try to address by, you know, certainly the most common clinical situations and it goes from pre-pregnancy, during pregnancy, time of delivery, postpartum and care of the infant. We really try to um, analyze new evidence every year and come up with the most up-to-date guidance. And so just um, for providers and patients to know that those two resources are available. Yes, and if I can also sort of reinforce and put a plug for the perinatal HIV hotline, um, because it is a, a resource that's available to all, like Dr. Bedell said, regardless of the your geographic location, um, and someone will always answer the phone um, and will help you, uh, you know, with, with your questions. And so um, please take advantage of it. No question is, um, you know, stupid. It's, it's good to ask if you don't know. Uh, particularly for providers who don't encounter and don't see uh, uh, pregnant individuals with, with HIV. What, what you don't want to do is to have the response that uh, Janelle's provider had, right? Like if you don't know, you just ask for help and support. Um, and, and it's totally okay to refer, but to do it in an appropriate way. So as discussed, the perinatal HIV AIDS hotline is a great resource and it can be reached 24-7 at 1-888-448-8765. And the perinatal HIV guidelines can be easily found on the internet. If you just search perinatal HIV guidelines, um, you'll be taken to a link and you can see the most up-to-date um, recommendations in a um, easy to navigate website with that's tabbed based on your sort of question or what you're looking to find out more about. Another thing we wanted to touch on today was optimal intrapartum management to prevent perinatal transmission. Um, for the parent, you know, if the viral load is over a thousand, which is usually checked around 36 weeks or as close to delivery as possible, if it's over a thousand, the recommendation is to schedule a cesarean delivery at 38 weeks. The reason that we recommend this at 38 weeks is because um, that allows optimal fetal lung maturity and um, for a term birth, but ideally prevents um, women or patients going into labor before this scheduled C-section can be um, performed. So it's sort of a balance of um, the gestational age, but trying not to get so close to the due date um, in order to ideally have this be a scheduled C-section before rupture of membranes and before labor. Also, we would recommend if the viral is over 1,000 that we begin the IVAZT, which Janelle was discussing, um, and in optimal scenario would be started at least three hours prior to the scheduled C-section. If viral load is less than 1,000, um, cesarean delivery solely for prevention of HIV transmission is not recommended. If the viral load is over 50 or detectable, consideration for um, use of AZT, if it's undetectable, then um, it's not recommended, although some patients after counseling may still desire to have AZT administered around the time of delivery, and that's still reasonable. And then we certainly need to make sure that we're continuing the ART regimen through the delivery and into the postpartum period. As far as um, some of the other obstetric things, um, the guidelines and same with the hotline can kind of walk through with providers in regards to um, use of um, intrapressure catheters and fetal monitoring and cord clamping and things that 
um, OB providers do for the most part. Um, for someone who's fully suppressed and is having a vaginal delivery, um, most of those interventions can still be used, although um, we would want to avoid um, fetal scalp electrodes and episiotomies or things that may increase um, exposure to blood um, unless really necessary for obstetric indications. Dr. Monflazer, would you like to talk about newborn care? Absolutely, yes. So, so what, what's important to remember is that um, for intrapartum care, obviously what you want to do is to make sure that the mother is, um, has a low viral load, right? And if the viral load is elevated, Dr. Bedell went through the different uh, interventions, including C-sections, using AZT, um, uh, at the time of labor uh, and delivery. But one other important measure um, is to also um, consider the newborn. And uh, for the newborn, it's very important to start antiretroviral uh, uh, agents uh, as soon as the baby's born, up to six hours of, of delivery. Um, and um, to also test uh, for HIV serially, um, and the schedule is uh, two to three weeks at one to two months and four to six months of life. And, and the reason why we test so often um, is because um, the infant is receiving a prophylaxis. And so it's important to establish a, a diagnosis if it's there. And so those um, uh, serial points are there just to ensure that um, we are testing the infant adequately uh, with or without uh, a prophylaxis. Now, um, the guidelines have sort of simplified how to provide a prophylaxis or treatment, when I mean by, by treatment is a three drug regimen for infants, based on how um, the, the, the mother or the person, um, uh, the pregnant person uh, was uh, at risk of transmitting the virus uh, for, uh, to, to the baby. Um, and there are multiple things that we take under consideration to determine if someone is low risk, uh, particularly what we're looking for is to make sure that the individual was suppressed uh, throughout pregnancy, particularly during the time of labor and delivery, because that's when the risk of HIV transmission goes, goes high. Um, and also that there was reported adherence, and most importantly, that they did not acquire HIV during pregnancy, uh, because uh, acquiring HIV during pregnancy is associated with a high risk of uh, transmission to the baby, even if the mom was suppressed uh, later on uh, throughout the pregnancy. So if the baby is deemed low risk, um, we provide um, zidovudine for two weeks. Um, now, if the baby is deemed high risk, particularly if this is someone who was not virally suppressed, who acquired HIV during pregnancy, um, or was not adherent um, and, and not engaging in care, um, then um, we go um, with a presumptive uh, therapy with three uh, antiretrovirals, uh, and we continue this for six weeks. Um, and, and for um, uh, uh, case scenarios that fall in between, particularly if um, um, uh, the infant is premature, then we provide um, zidovudine for four to six weeks. Now, um, if the HIV test, and what we do in terms of testing is, is um, a nucleic acid uh, amplification test. So this could be either an RNA or a DNA uh, viral load. Uh, if that is positive, um, then we have a confirmed diagnosis and we start a, a three drug regimen. Um, one of the reasons why we don't uh, perform an antibody test uh, for infants um, is because um, their immune system uh, takes a couple of weeks to kick in, and also because there is a passive immunization from uh, the mother, um, and so we would be detecting the antibody of the mother. In regards to postnatal HIV care, the US HIV guidelines on postnatal care is to provide evidence-based counseling to support shared decision-making about infant feeding, arrange for new or continued supportive services to ensure ART adherence, and to discuss future reproductive plans. Ideally, um, these things have been discussed during pregnancy as far as how the patient would like to feed their infant, 
you know, what we can do to help support them knowing that the postpartum period is very challenging for most women for a variety of reasons. And often um, patients may have taken very good care of themselves in pregnancy and in the postpartum period, the shift goes to baby and, and patients start missing their own appointments or caring for themselves. It's also a time where depression and anxiety peak, um, which can also interfere with um, people taking care of themselves. And so even during pregnancy, making sure support is there, that um, patients know where to reach out, um, support as far as their ART adherence, because it's still really important they continue on their medications, and that you know they had decided their reproductive plans during pregnancy. It may change postpartum, so readdressing it, but making sure that their um, reproductive goals are met in regards to if they desire contraception, and if so, which one, and we're able to give it to them. Um, in regards to, to infant feeding, um, for patients with a detectable viral load or with any concerns to their um, adherence, the recommendation in the United States is for formula. Um, the newest recommendation for patients who are fully suppressed on an um, ARV regimen who desire to breastfeed should be supported in this. Um, that in itself, it could be a whole other um, CME in regards to how to do that safely, but for patients to be aware that there, that there is support and the, the guidelines are changing um, in order to um, allow HIV positive patients and their infants to benefit from breastfeeding um, if they can do it safely by being fully suppressed and with um, additional monitoring of them and their infant in the postpartum period. Yes, and if I may also add, um, what I'd like the, the audience to remember is that the majority of pregnant individuals tend to engage um, adequately during pregnancy. Obviously, there are variation, but for the most part, most individuals um, really want to prevent the transmission of HIV to their, to their uh, fetus. Um, but there's a lot of data demonstrating that um, people fall out of care after delivery. Um, and it's really because they have competing priorities um, and it, it's hard to keep up with um, pediatric care in addition to their own care and uh, antiretroviral uh, adherence. And so it's very important uh, before um, uh, labor and delivery during the pregnancy period to prepare uh, people for that transition. And one of the important things for preparation is to have a conversation about infant feeding. Um, because if we don't ask, um, patients don't necessarily tell us. And um, it's important to, to know this information because there is data emerging showing that uh, people have been breastfeeding, even if their providers are not aware. And we want to be able to uh, provide support so that um, if patients decide that they do want to um, breastfeed, that it can be done in a safe and supportive way. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a, uh, an area where we need more data and we need more guidance to figure out how to best monitor the mother and the infant. Um, but the guidelines do provide general guidance about this. Um, but um, with what Janelle described with having sort of um, diverse experiences based on the type of provider, right, it's very important that everybody's on board, the pediatrician, the OBGYN physician, the HIV provider, in, in supporting the, 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 the patient uh, with their infant feeding decision, with whichever you know, direction it goes to that people are, are ready to not stigmatize the patient and provide the education, provide the counseling and help them through that decision-making process. It's never okay to call uh, Child Protective Services uh, for a patient who uh, decides to breastfeed. For my, myself, breastfeeding wasn't an option. Um, it wasn't even really discussed as an option at the time. Um, of course, my youngest is eight years old, so we know the data has been updated since then. Um, but even in just my research, and I'm sure that most doctors will know that, you know, patients 
uh, should not Google anything that they're going to get into medically, but I think it happens. And unfortunately, um, the worst case scenario sort of exists out there. Um, there's like a whole documentary about a woman who uh, had her child taken away because she breastfed them while living with HIV. That's on YouTube. And, 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 and it's just, it was the thing that was like, whoop, that's for sure not going to be me. So that's one of the reasons why I chose not to, but I've been very blessed to meet and know, um, several advocates who have um, kiddos who are um, between the ages of like three and one year old who breastfed um, and um, their children are negative. So there is hope. Um, and so, um, yeah, just there, there are women out there, um, you know, social media is a powerful thing. Um, so uh, letting them know that there are advocates out online who will share their experiences could be very helpely to them. Um, so absolutely, that's the only thing I wanted to chime in. And, and that even though, you know, I, I grew up in a family of, of pure breastfeeders, I was the first person in my family to not breastfeed. And um, although it was kind of, um, it was sad for me, but there were ways for me to, for you to bond with your children, you know, skin to skin while you're feeding a bottle, all those things that exist no matter what, whether you're breastfeeding or, or not in any case. Um, but that there are positive examples, I guess, pun intended out there, um, to show women and, and, and families, um, and anyone who's, um, experiencing pregnancy, um, with HIV for them to go out and, and, and seek, um, and to know that, you know, I'm just very grateful to be a part of this community of advocates who share their life online. And if there's any recommendations needed, let me know. Well, thank you so much for your insight today, Dr. Monplazer and, and also Alejandra. We truly appreciate you sharing your story with us and, and giving context to this and, um, and being such a fierce advocate for others living with HIV. Um, thank you for participating, for joining us. Let's pull it together with our SMART goals to apply in practice. After today, we hope that participants will discuss reproductive desires and plans with all persons with HIV of childbearing potential on an ongoing basis as just part of the continuum of their care. We also hope you'll utilize the updated Department of Health and Human Services perinatal HIV guidelines to implement recommendations for optimal management of pregnant persons with HIV to prevent perinatal transmission also to provide all pregnant persons with HIV with ongoing patient education on the importance of achieving and maintaining HIV viral suppression through ART, and proactively engaging pregnant people with HIV in shared decision-making discussions on postnatal plans and infant feeding options. And thank you all for participating and providing the best care for your patients. Take care.